Good afternoon. My name is Tim Markle. I'm director of the Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs. We're out of the Waysman Center. This is Conversations on Showing Up for Kids, where we have some nice, casual, hopefully fun, and informative conversations about what matters to families who have children with disabilities. Um, we are being recorded, and our guests know we're being recorded. I'd like to remind everybody that because we are being recorded and will be on the web, please avoid any personal identifiable information, personal identifiable health information. Um, we wanna protect um, our privacy as much as possible. I am so totally excited today um, to be joined by Meredith and Lisa. They are part of an awesome team that works with the Southern Regional Center to serve parents and the providers who serve those parents. Um, so I'm gonna give them a chance to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what drew you to Waysman Center and being the off the fly host that I am, um, totally forgot to say who was going to start. So I will leave it up to you guys to rock, paper, scissors, um, you know, virtually thumb wrestle, um, however you want to determine who goes first, but just tell us a little bit about yourself and what drew you to working at the Waysman Center. I'll start. Um, so I'm Lisa. I um, am a social worker. And I um, first was drawn to the Weisman Center as a student. I worked on a research project. And, um, and then my first job out of college, um, after getting my master's in social work, um, was as a support broker, um, which is now um, no longer a um, position in the same way it was, so it may not be familiar to people, but basically a case manager for adults with disabilities. And um, through that job, I got to come to different things through the Waysman Center. So trainings, outreach, I got to know the Waysman Ties Behavioral Consultants, the Waysman Inclusion Nursing or WIN program, and through the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic, their um, Communication Development Program, or CDP. Um, and so I was really impressed with all the things that Waisman offers and, and um, really tries to um, connect with people around the state in regards to human development and disabilities. Um, and so I, I was very fortunate to um, to start working here. And, and here I am now, um, almost three years into oh, wow. the Weissman Center. That's, that's been a little while. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Lisa. Meredith. Hi, I'm Meredith. Um, I have been with the Weissman Center for just over a year. Um, and what drew me here, um, I've been, I'm a social worker um, and I've worked in a couple different settings for cumulatively over a decade. Um, but I also had early interface with the Weissman Center. Um, I actually accompanied a lot of families whose child has a disability to clinic appointments. And that's kind of how I first got to know um, Weissman. So when um, this opportunity became available, I've always enjoyed most um, out of all the work that I've done supporting families whose child has a disability. And um, with all the goals and mission, you know, visions and missions that Weissman has, it was a really good natural fit for me to be able to come here. That's kind of what I feel too, is it, it kind of felt like a natural fit, um, given my family background and some of my professional background. So I'm glad you both feel that same way as well, because um, I really like that idea of fitting in, fitting in where you work um, kind of makes life a little more manageable. Um, and I really enjoy that. So speaking about work, now I have you down as I think all our promos were information and referral specialists at the Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs at the Waysman Center, which does not fit on any known size business card. So it's a very long title and I feel sorry for you guys every time you have to um, answer the phone or introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about information referral specialists, what it is that you do and how people should get a hold of you 
if they want to. Don't make me call on you, you because you know I will. <laughs> How about I'll share a little bit about what we do. And then Lisa, I know you have um, that you wanted to share our website, which has the how to contact us part. So that would be um, cool. Yeah, thank you. That'll be great. As information and referral specialist, Lisa and I work with two other colleagues also, um, Amy and Lynn. And I guess how I would describe it is um, people can reach out to us by phone or email with any question that they have about a kiddo um, age zero to 21 with any type of disability. And our goal is always to be as helpful as possible in providing information or referral um, around whatever that question might be. That's my short answer. Lisa, I don't know if you have anything to add kind of to what you would describe that we do. Yeah. Um, well, let me start by sharing how people can get in touch with us and then we can talk about um, some examples of calls that we get. So, um, I believe I'm sharing our website, is that right? That looks okay. good. And so um, this is the Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs website for the Southern Regional Center. And as you scroll down, you will see a variety of resources um, and our contact information. So we have two phone numbers, 608-265-8610. Eight hundred five three two three three two one, and people can also email us at cyshcn at wasteman .wisc .edu. and here's our map. So the southern region covers Adams County, Columbia, Crawford, Dane, Dodge. Grant, Green, Iowa, Juneau, Lafayette, Richland, Rock, Sauk, and Vernon counties. And um, our phone number and email are listed here again. So that's how to contact us. Um, so, the types of calls we get, um, well, they come from family members, school staff, professionals, um, community members, and we'll talk to anyone. Our focus is, as Meredith said, children um, with special health care needs, ages zero to 21. Um, and others can refer families to us. Um, we're happy to reach out to families. Um, and we can call families with an interpreter. Um, we get calls about all types of evaluations, whether it's where to go for an autism evaluation, a neuropsychological evaluation. Um, we get calls about accessing school services and an individualized education plan, 504 plans. Um, we talk to families who wanna brainstorm and get support and talk through options and next steps. Um, we'll talk about how to find a good primary care provider or therapist or other medical provider. Um, we keep lists of current support groups that are meeting in the area for families um, around various topic areas. And um, we also keep updated lists about autism treatment providers and what insurances are accepted. Um, we do our best to connect families to things that their insurance accepts. Um, insurances can be complicated, so we do our best in that area. Um, and then there's, I would say there's kind of an other category for things like um, where to get a disabled parking permit or just those things that 
um, if you don't know where to call, um, we're a good place to, to check. And, and just Lisa, to be clear, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Meredith. Something I wanted to add is I think some of the reason um, that sometimes we ask some extra questions or, um, you know, if families have time, we take extra time on the phone because we do want to give them an answer that's as um, personalized or relevant as possible. I was thinking about that, Lisa, when you were saying, like, we try to know information about um, who accepts what type of insurance. We know that families or, you know, community providers um, or doctors, whatever, are so busy, right, and have a lot on their plate and a lot of things that are they are juggling. And whenever I'm talking, you know, with somebody on the phone, I just want my information and kind of ideas and offerings to be as helpful as possible and as streamlined, right? Um, so that we aren't sending them on a wild goose chase. I know that's something that's important to all of us. Well, exactly, is that families don't want to call somewhere to just be told, call another place. Um, and so being able to find those resources that will be their good next steps. I know are really important to you guys. And I just wanted to highlight, um, thinking back to the map that Lisa, Lisa showed is, yes, we are situated in the Waysman Center. Yes, we are in Madison, which sits in the middle of Dane County or so, but we have other counties that parents call from and parents serve. So do you guys get calls from rural families as well from some of our other counties? We certainly do. Um, and it the resources can differ um, moderate to significantly depending mm -hmm. on what county you live in. And so that is a question that we'll ask, you know, if parents or providers are comfortable sharing that information with us about what county they're calling from. Um, and that also loops back to us trying to give the best suited recommendation possible, right? The best information possible for that um, family or other caller, um, because what someone might um, have access to or might be feasible to, you know, in Grant County could really be different than in Dane County. Um, or even if you live in Madison versus I don't know, some other city in Dane County, right? Maybe, there can maybe be, Stoughton. Let's say Stoughton, maybe for Stoughton. instance. Yes. Mm -hmm. The wonderful yeah, town of Stoughton. Different. Cool. So what, what kind of calls in general do you, I mean, do you get like, are there general uh, like calls that you almost always get or that once a week somebody calls about blank or it seems I'm most often talking about this or is it like totally across the board? What sort of calls do you guys get? Yeah, we get a variety of calls. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Um, so a parent might call and say, my child's development is looking a little different and I'm wondering who to talk to, what to do, whether to get an evaluation or where. Um, so that's kind of one type of questioning that we get. Um, Sometimes families will call saying they're looking for a mental health provider and they're not sure where to start. Um, we'll also get this one a lot. Um, my child just got an autism diagnosis and we're looking to access autism therapy or autism treatment. We're looking for an occupational therapist. Um, the evaluator also recommended speech therapy so we're looking to have those services locally and covered by insurance. I can think of a couple other topics that I know we really um, like talking about with families. Um, we're always um, happy to talk about the concept of having a medical home with families when they call us, right? Because that is so important for a child with a special health care need. Um, and then we also are... Can I put you on the spot, Meredith? And can you explain just briefly what a medical home is? Because that may not be familiar to some of our listeners. 
Yeah. Um, when I think about a medical home, I think it definitely starts with the relationship that you have with your child's primary care provider, um, making sure that there's a good connection and relationship there, not only with the provider, but the clinic that your child is being seen at, um, nurses or schedulers or, you know, all of those people that are involved in your child's care. But I also really think about the communication um, between other specialists or care providers and the primary care provider, kind of a bigger picture medical home, right? All of these people are providing care to your child in one way or another. And a lot of the information that, um, each provider has, it's important for all, everyone who's involved in your child's care to be aware of. So kind of that communication and collaboration between everybody who's um, helping to support your child. Thanks for letting me interrupt your thoughts. So now continue with whatever your thought was after medical home. For sure. Um, uh, we love to um, be a source of information for families whose child is entering transition age. Um, so when they're starting to get, you know, when a child with a special health care need is maybe entering like those early teen years working towards 18 and change changes in service systems happen at different times. Um, and so we just always want uh, families to know that we're willing to talk with them about what that process of moving from like pediatric care or child service realm to adult care and adult services looks like. And Lisa, you've had some experience in that area of transitioning into adult services. Can you just talk a little bit about how important that being prepared for transition is? Because the two, the child system and the adult system, you would think we know what's coming up, that this system knows what this system does, and that there's some really beautiful, wonderful bridge that just you just gently walk. But we know that it's not that smooth and easy. So can you talk a little bit more about transition? Yeah. Yeah, so this can be a scary time for families. I, I would say most families that I talk to feel like the handholding, the, the support that they feel through the school, yeah. um, the thought of that ending is terrifying and it's going off into the unknown. Um, having conversations about um, transition starting as early as possible um, can help. And, um, and certainly we can be a part of that as um, your Southern Regional Center. Um, the school can be a part of that. Um, and the Aging and Disability Resource Center um, can also be a part of that. So um, we'll work with families through the transition, you know, it's, it's kind of a gray area of, um, you know, sometimes we talk about age 21, but really um, we're happy to be here with families um, through any of the transition time um, to adulthood. The ADRC, the Aging and Disability Resource Centers for each county, will talk with families um, at any time about questions but officially they'll start helping families apply for services and get connected to the adult system starting at age 17 and a half. Um, and so we're happy to be a part of the conversation. Families can call us, um, you know, even if there's not a particular question you have in mind, you're not sure what you want to ask. If you just want to talk through, wow, this is scary. Um, I'm not sure what we're looking for here. We're not sure what to ask of the school. We're happy just to talk through um, kind of those fears and help kind of draft the next one to two steps with you. Yeah, I like that idea of the next one to two steps because I know there's a million things that I could do, but I need to focus on what is the next most important thing that I need to do to help my child move along. Um, so I like that focus. I remember 
some information referral specialists at one point said that one of their favorite parts of answering the phone was when parents would call and say, okay, someone said I could, should call you and I don't know why. And they loved that question because they, they then got to explore with the parent all of the strengths of the things that they're already doing with their family because all families have strengths. All families are already engaging. So you start with that conversation and then figure out where is it that they may want to go. So I, I always like that about it. Do you guys have like favorite parts of your job uh, that you like to do or calls that you really like to talk to? What do you like to do? That's so true. I definitely have that experience where um, people call and they say, you know, I scribbled down your phone number. I can't remember where I got it or, or maybe why the person gave it to me. Um, and it is an opportunity to explore. And yes, always families are doing a lot. Um, and so we, we can start there and then um, again, talk about maybe one to two things that they want to try working on. Um, my favorite part about the job is um, following up with families. So I always offer after I talk with a family and we identify those one to two steps, I offer to follow up with them in a few weeks and to see how things are going. And um, sometimes, you know, the, the next step is just to talk to the primary care provider and um, have a conversation with them and, and, you know, ask some specific questions. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily like a groundbreaking update, um, but I, I really appreciate hearing kind of families' journeys and, and their experiences are very helpful because we're talking to families all day long. And so their experience can inform the next family. Um, and so I, I really appreciate them willing to, to share that. And they really are, are helping um, the next family that I talk to. See, and I, I love that because I believe that a lot of the best help comes from family to family. The second best help comes from um, sort of a communal family gathering spot which as you learn more from families, you're able to then help other families based on what that family told you. And so I, I think that that idea of being a hub and the holder of collective knowledge um, is really cool for families. How about you, Meredith? Well, I swear that Lisa and I didn't plan this, but okay. I wrote that my favorite part is getting to learn from parents, um, you know, hearing from them what they're experiencing, what they're being told, um, where they're finding roadblocks in the system, um, and just kind of learning from them the reality of um, what navigating different paths for their child looks like. Um, because we do then get to learn. I learn from parents every time I talk to them, and then I can be better informed when I talk to the next parent. Um, and you're right, Lisa, that when we offer to follow up with families, that is um, such a great opportunity for us to kind of hear how things have gone over the past few weeks, um, successes and, you know, where things have been a little bit harder um, so that we can make sure that the next phone call that we have, we're, we're always giving the best information that we can. So in, in addition to you guys wanting to follow up and you guys do follow up with parents, you know, two to three weeks after the call, can parents call back and just say, you know what, that resource you gave me is no longer in existence, or that was the best thing that I've ever connected to, or, hey, we got that done. What could I do next? Are they allowed to call multiple times? I always let families know um, that they can call us anytime, right? Like we want to be um, a good support and, and as their child approaches age 21. Um, so to call us as many times as they feel necessary. Um, I actually had an occasion the other week where I gave somebody a phone number and 
the mom called me right back and was like, that phone number didn't work. And I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you know, and did a little bit of digging and found the right number. But thank goodness she told me yeah. that this agency had changed their phone number. Otherwise I would have kept giving, you know, been giving out information that wasn't accurate. So that was the time we got, I got some really quick feedback, which was good. But um, I always hope that the information and referrals that we give to families are helpful and that um, because of that, then they do call us next time they have a question. Um, you know, we always hope to help with that. Thank you. And I know that during this time and we're approaching the end of our time together today, um, I know at this time, just so that people are clear, is um, if they decide to call, which we hope they will, because obviously you guys really want to talk to people. Um, but chances are when they call the 800 number or the other number, they're not going to get a live voice right away. What is the current system of how people get in touch with you if they choose to call? Yeah, so right now we're working remotely during the COVID pandemic. And um, typically uh, families or callers will get our voicemail um, and we call back as soon as we can. Um, we all work part-time, um, but we, we do call back as, as soon as we are able. Um, and we ask that families leave their email address in their voicemail if they would prefer an email or would like to set up a time to talk um, so that we're not playing phone tag. Um, and then um, if phone is the best way to communicate, we will, we will call back as soon as we can. Fantastic. And I know you also mentioned um, that we do have access to interpreters. And so even if English is not the first language or language you would prefer to communicate in as we will work, with getting an interpreter on the line so that we can understand each other and communicate with each other. Um, so now's your chance for your final thoughts. Give me your best, oh, 10, 20, 30 second commercial about why should, let's start with a family. Why should a family call the regional center? I would say families should call the Southern Regional Center because we are very friendly. And as you mentioned before, we like to talk. <laughs> we like to chat. We want to see how things are going for you and just see, you know, for a lot of families, they are absolutely doing all of the right things and making all the right calls. They really are. So sometimes it's just reinforcing to a family, you are doing what you can. Um, but other times we have little tidbits of information um, that might be helpful to a family in accessing services or locating a support that they had been um, searching for. Any other thoughts, Lisa? Yeah, I, I'll say that we're here and we want to talk with you. Um, if you're feeling stuck, not sure even what your question is, we're happy to talk and identify one or two steps to take. That's awesome. And then um, I, I will add on my behalf that for those multitude of providers and educators, clinicians and nurses that are assisting the families who have children with special health care needs, is that we know that you are very good at what you do. But this is a really huge, complicated system. And sometimes it takes help to navigate it. We want to be there to help you fill in the gaps of support for your families. Is we don't expect you to know everything about the system, but we want to be able to work through where those questions that you have are and where your families may be able to get supports next. Um, so families and the providers who support them are more than willing, more than welcome to call you guys. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, hope to have you all on again in a few months. Um, maybe we'll have some definite questions that people would like to have answered, or we can get into a couple scenarios, but just continue to let people get familiar with who the Southern Regional Center is and the people that are connecting with them. So thank you both very much. Um, and for those listening online, please feel free 
to uh, do the evaluation that's attached to the video as well in the description. We really like to know how we're doing. Lisa, Meredith, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Jim. And if you want to hang on, we'll say goodbye also offline after the recording stops. So. <laughs>